The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Debate Preparation. Hi. Uh, in a couple of days, I'm doing a, a debate. It's not, they don't want to list it as a debate. Anytime you're going to have two people sit down with differing views to have a discussion, I'm fine with calling it a debate. I've, we've had uh, dialectic dialogues, discussions, all the words with the D these time for all of you King Crimson fans. Uh, referencing elephant talk, I thought would be wonderful. Um, so I will frequently post the debates that I do. I plan to post this one that's coming up on Monday. And when the debates are over, I go back and review them to try to find mistakes that I've made, mistakes my opponent made, things we did well. Uh, and so there, there are occasionally debate reviews. Uh, but there's never really been a, hey, I've got a debate coming up and here's how I'm going about preparing for it. And this one is fairly straightforward, and I knew what was going to happen, and I thought uh, I would do a, an unprepared, free-form uh, video so that you can see kind of what my thoughts are as I do my initial prep. Now, a lot of times, if I'm going into something that is an interview, I don't want to know the questions in advance. I prefer to think on my feet. There are a lot of people who will tell you this is a mistake. They may well be correct. I'm not saying that the way that I do things is necessarily the best way. Um, I had uh, a friend of mine, when I told him I didn't want to know who I was debating, if I could avoid it, uh, pointed out why they felt that that was a very bad mistake, because if, if there's someone who is uh, one note in their debating style, that they only have the one argument and go for it, it's probably worthwhile to know that so that you can at least spend more time focusing on that, even if they show up with something off the wall. My reasons for not wanting to know who I was debating were more about preparing. I didn't want to prepare for the person. I wanted to prepare for the subjects uh, because I didn't at any time want to be attacking the individual. I didn't want to be confusing the individual and their thoughts about something with the actual arguments in the debate uh, that were going to be presented in the debate. So that was the way I used to prepare. Now I'm fine with knowing you know, who my debate opponent is, and I continue to pre prepare broadly. Um, I am, if somebody called me right now and said, we'd like you to come do a debate downtown in an hour, I would go and I would do it. And I think there's a way to deal with and handle all those things. I'm not saying that I don't need debate preparation after so many years of doing it. Um, I just don't need as much preparation to be able to address things. I mean, I've done live TV for 14 plus years. But despite that, I still do some prep work. And Monday's event is a discussion between myself and someone from, from Ravi Zacharias Ministries. And what they wanted, they said, we're just gonna present you with a list of questions and allow each of you to address these questions and then take questions from the audience. So it's not, there's no subject for the debate. It's not like, does God exist? Or, you know, is there an afterlife? Um, it, it's a list of questions. And when they first told me this, uh, my first thought was, I don't want to see the questions. I, I want to just go out there and think on my feet uh, because I know I do better in many cases that way. I'm also not delusional enough to think that this is the best way to go about preparing for it. So I thought what I'd do is I have the email here that they just sent me um, this morning with the five questions that we are both going to be expected to address. Obviously, we're not going to know what the audience is going to ask. And I thought I would go through uh, several of these to give you kind of a peek into, hey, I've just, I'm, I haven't spent any time yet really thinking about these questions since I got them this morning, but they're questions that we've all addressed many times in the past. So let's start. So the first thing that happens when I get this email is I look down and I see, hey, there's five questions and uh, notice that we're going to have dinner at this particular restaurant at 5 p.m. before the event. Um, I'm going to read all five questions so you can get a feel for what the event is going to be like. Uh, this is exactly how I do it when I get it. Question number one, what is a common misconception Christians have of atheists? Question number two, can you guess? Of course, what is a common misconception atheists have of Christians? Um, I'm not completely sure, just looking at those first two questions, if we're both meant to address both of those questions. It seems strange for a Christian to tell me what he thinks Christians misunderstand about atheism uh, and vice versa. But it might be interesting and there may be some really good insight because 
if I were asked, well, when I get to the second question, I guess we'll take a look at it. What are misconceptions atheists have about Christians? I could go on for ages, but that's partially because I've been on both sides of this and I've spent a good chunk of my time as an atheist uh, doing what I can to make sure that other atheists aren't misrepresenting Christianity, that you don't go challenging uh, a, a Protestant, a Southern Baptist with Catholic doctrine about transubstantiation, things like that. Question number three, what is the meaning and purpose of life? Why are we here? Question four, how do you or how does your worldview explain, address, or resolve the problem of evil and suffering? And the fifth question, what is your belief on the afterlife and how does that belief affect or speak to your life in the present? So I can already tell, and, and I did have a telephone conversation with the organizer. Um, we didn't go through the questions specifically, but they, they had some wording and some ideas in mind. What they want, this is for Austin Think Week, is they want something that's not a combative debate thing of, ah, here's why you're wrong, and here's why you're wrong, and here's why you're wrong. You're wrong. They want to actually have a productive discussion, and I'm a huge fan of this. As a matter of fact, when they contacted me, people's impressions of what I do differ depending on what they've seen. If all you've seen is highlight clips from the show, then I'm yelling at people, no, 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 you're done, and hanging up because those are the parts that people pull out. They don't tend to pull out the 40-minute conversation that I had with someone uh, who was despondent about the possibility of giving up their God belief and, and exer exercising patience and seeing me walk through that. They see that highlight clip. Uh, if they go out and watch the debates I've done, depending very much on who I'm on stage with, they're going to get slightly different impressions of, for example, me with uh, Blake or John Ferrer or uh, Cliff Connectly than they are with me and Sight and Bergenkate or Ray Comfort or uh, Matt Slick. Uh, maybe. And so their thought was, is this something Matt would even be interested in? And the truth is, as many of you are aware, that part of the reason for doing posting these debates and the reviews is that I'd like to change the way uh, I do debates and encourage other people to do the same so that we're not just showing up and I talk for 10 minutes and you talk for 10 minutes and then I explain why you're wrong and you explain why I'm wrong and then there's no real interaction. I like the discussion. I, I, I value that. The reason it doesn't always work as well on the TV show is because we have people who, um, who aren't very conversant with it and who, quite honestly, don't always have the ability to argue and engage honestly and straightforward. If you ask someone a question, and all they do is dodge the question. If that happens in a debate, you can easily point that out. The moderator's there, the audience gets to see it, and it's easily corrected. Um, or at least it's something that you can point out, and it doesn't turn into this, no, uh, no, 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 let me put your ass on hold and blah, blah, blah. So looking at the questions, what it, starting with the first one, which is probably where I suspect this is gonna be laying the groundwork for what people, what I want people to understand about atheists, which is, what is a common misconception Christians have of atheists? At first blush, um, we're all aware that there are certainly some theists who view atheists as if uh, we worship the devil. That's not the misconception that I think I would start with. I'm not even sure I would start with anything in that line. Uh, because there are lots of things that have been said about atheists that need to be corrected. The, the notion that we're uh, devil-worshipping, baby-killing monsters. But I don't think that's what most people think of when they think of atheists. I could be wrong. I'm not most people. I haven't even interviewed most people. But I'm trying to, to do this as reasonably as possible. And putting back on my Christian hat, when I heard about atheists or when I thought about atheists, um, one of the most common things was I thought they just didn't know you know, like nobody had ever shared the gospel with them. And it may be, and I'm not completely sure what my answer is going to be on Monday. I'm going to be thinking about this more over the next couple of days. My first instinct here is to point out that um, if you presume, or this misconception is that atheists just have some weak or inaccurate or incomplete understanding of whatever religion somebody's putting forward, and that certainly can be true of some people, but it's not true of most atheists. And we know from studies, for example, 
um, that atheists tend to know the Bible better than believers on average, and they tend to know more about world religions and the history of these things on average than believers. Uh, this isn't about who's smarter, um, and it, it certainly doesn't mean that there aren't atheists who are incredibly ill-informed. But if your beginning perception is that these people uh, just don't know, you are likely to be mistaken. Uh, and we have myself, uh, as a former Southern Baptist, we have the 700 plus members of the clergy project, which gives me an opportunity to talk about this. Uh, we have information from studies that there are non-believers, atheists, who are sitting there in churches around the world um, who don't believe. Another thing that, that comes to mind as, as something to potentially address here, and I, I don't know if we're only going to stick with just one misconception, um, is this idea that we're somehow something went wrong for us, like we had a bad experience with church, or we are rebelling against God, or we just want to sin. Uh, and this is really this stuff stems from what people are taught as Christians, that, you know, God gave us over to reprobate minds and that we are, uh, even if we don't know that we're worshiping Satan, we have been misled and misguided by Satan. Um, I think another thing that might be worth clearing up is for skeptics, for critical thinking atheists such as myself, where my non-belief is the result of evaluating the issues and not being convinced that there's actually a God, is this, the question that comes up all the time is, what would change your mind? Um, because there are some that have a misconception that atheists, um, you know, we, hey, we're just, our standards are just too high. Uh, that everybody knows you can't prove God exists, it's a matter of faith, and you just don't have faith. Uh, all of those things are potential discussion points. I'd like to find a way uh, by Monday to, to weave the fine points of those together into a statement um, that really addresses the question. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this kind of pre-debate prep video, because normally you, you see the debate and then you see my reviews afterwards, so it's all in hindsight. This is about me attempting to anticipate what's going to happen, trying to build a strategy, and then when you watch the debate you can see what strategy I actually went with. And when I talk about this in strategy, my goal for all of this is to just have a, a conversation that allows people the best chance at accurately understanding who I am, why I don't believe what I don't believe, um, that some of their assumptions about me might be wrong. You know, in my case, as a former Southern Baptist, I mean, if you go back and watch the debate I did with Mike Lacona, there were people who went to church with me when I was a teenager who showed up at that debate specifically to ask you know, questions while I was there. Uh, the second question, what's a common misconception atheists have of Christians? If I'm asked, I think it's probably in my best interest to point out that there are a lot of atheists who view Christians as if they're somehow stupid um, that, you know, or weak-minded in some sense. Not just that they're not necessarily intelligent, that they're emotionally lacking. This notion that, oh, well, there's some people who need religion. I don't need religion. Um, I, I think that is a, a common misconception. I mean, I hear, I hear stuff like that all the time, and um, it's, it's simply not true. I mean, you know, I have my disagreements with uh, a number of Christian apologists who are incredibly bright. Uh, Blake and I have done a number of debates. I don't for a second think that Blake is stupid. Um, I think that we have uh, different epistemological foundations, particularly with respect to the supernatural. But that answer is not going to fly. That is an answer when I, epistemology, foundations, supernatural. I don't for a second presume that the bulk of, of any audience is going to grasp what I meant, even if they're really even robustly familiar with the terms. It's a little too specialized in the language. And I think that a way to kind of address this, where maybe I can hit both of these at, at the same time, is that there are people who, who think that skeptics are just opposed uh, unrealistically to ever accepting that there's something supernatural. And from the skeptic's point of view, my position is that the people who are advocating for religious belief, who are advocating for the supernatural, um, have some either flawed evidential foundation where they're too prone to thinking if we don't have an explanation, 
maybe it's supernatural. And, and if we start with maybe it's supernatural, then maybe it's likely it's supernatural. They don't have an established level for their burden of proof for the supernatural. And it, I think if you kind of walk in the door, like Blake and I both walk in the door. Sorry to keep referencing you, buddy, but we, we've had this conversation, so I, I know you'll at least uh, know where I'm coming from. Um, if Blake and I both walk in the door and someone puts forward a supernatural explanation for some observed phenomenon, my starting point is not, the supernatural is impossible, so your explanation is no good. My starting point is instead, I am not convinced that the supernatural is possible, so you've got some extra work to do before you can begin to posit that as an explanation. And Blake's position, and if, if, forgive me if I'm misstating it, and, and the position of many believers is, hmm, well, I don't know that the supernatural is impossible, and I've been come convinced for various other reasons that it is in fact possible, so I have to include this as a possible explanation for this phenomenon. I, I think that kind of leads us down a path where we're unjustified. So on questions one and two, what's the common misconceptions that one has of the other? Um, somehow or another, I think we're going to have to have mention that this isn't just a matter of IQ. Um, it isn't even necessarily a matter of knowledge. Uh, I know atheists who know the Bible way better than any Christian you're likely to meet, or almost any, I would suppose. And then I know some Christians who know the Bible way better than I do. And yet, none of that's relevant, because at the end of the day, if there is a God who's communicating a message, it shouldn't just be only those people who have the absolute perfect understanding of this that should be able to, to go down that route, because that sets us up for, you have to believe first, and then you can believe. So you have to believe that there's a God, you have to believe that there's a supernatural, you have to believe that there's value in this book, and if you're just reading through it and you get there, you know, and you're in Genesis chapter 10, where it starts talking about uh, Noah's children, uh, as we talked about in the last video, uh, you could, be, I don't know how you could really fault someone to say, I don't really think I'm getting that much out of this book. But there's a number of misconceptions. I'm going to keep thinking on those. Question number three, what is the meaning and purpose of life? Why are we here? Oh my gosh, this is, this is a huge question. This is, it covers massive ground. Immediately, I'm going to Chris Johnson's book. If you go to theatheistbook.com, you'll find it. He also has a documentary there. It's a hundred atheists giving their thoughts on joy and meaning in a life without God. Uh, and that's, I, I might have misworded the title just a little bit, but that's essentially what it is. Hey, everybody seems to care about this meaning and purpose. I have a number of, of lines that I've gone down where I've talked about, you know, you wouldn't want the government to pick your job, you wouldn't want your parents to pick your job. In all these other circumstances, an externally imposed purpose is something we would reject. And you know, when it comes to the grand purpose of life, we, we seem to want or appreciate the fact that a god or something might give us purpose. Um, my answer, which I'll, you know, format in a slightly different way, I guess, is that there, I don't see that there is or could be or should be any intrinsic purpose to my life from an external point of view. I don't think that, uh, you know, evolution doesn't have, work with a purpose. I don't think that there's a cosmic mind in the universe that, that uh, manipulated things in order to produce me, in order to produce, in order for me to have a purpose. Um, one of the nice things about recognizing that I don't see any external purpose is that it frees me up to give my life whatever purpose I want. If, my, if I want my life to be about uh, having conversations like this, about teaching people, about trying to bridge the gap, about conf having conflicts over um, disagreements that I think are potentially harmful, then that gets to be the purpose of my life. I get to, st I'm, I'm not saying that I can overcome you know, determinism or anything else, I get to steer my ship as much as I can reasonably expect to. It reminds me of Dan Dennett's uh, book, The Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting. Um, that's Elba Room, the, the subtitles, The Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting. Uh, I hope we don't get into a kind of a, a, a side discussion about free will because meaning and purpose is already a big enough conversation. I think I've addressed this enough times that I, I don't know that I need to spend a great deal of time trying to come up with something new. Um, the only goal here is to make sure that I point out that I don't think I have an externally imposed purpose, that I'm not sure that I would want one, 
even if one existed, that the people who are claiming I have an externally imposed purpose are not necessarily offering up a purpose that I find value in, nor do I think it's true, and that waking up in a universe that didn't design me with a purpose is not something that makes me sad or makes me despondent. It's like saying, when we look around the universe and we say, uh, atheists will frequently say things like, oh, the universe doesn't care about you. If anything, the universe, you know, I think it was um, Stephen Hawking was pointing out that uh, if the universe is designed for anything, it's for the creation of black holes. Or, and other people pointed out that the universe, the, the vast majority of the universe is hostile to us. Only, you know, tiny portions of this tiny rock that we're on, uh, which in the vastness of what we know about cosmic things, uh, we are incredibly insignificant. And yet, to us, we are the most significant thing. There could be nothing more important to me than me, um, apart from possibly placing others above myself, um, which now we get into a conversation about uh, altruism and whether or not it can come from a selfish foundation. But at the end of the day, when they're asking, why are we here? Um, I understand the appeal of this question. I understand why people might want there to be um, an answer but I don't think it's the right question. We are here. What are we going to do about it? I like that. I might, I might use that. Um, and let me know. I mean, if you watch the debate afterwards, whether or not I used it, maybe this, maybe this was better than what I'll actually do on the day. Uh, question four, essentially, how does your worldview resolve the problem of evil and suffering? This ties in with the previous question, um, because the problem of evil is, a, is a, an argument or a category of arguments against the notion of a loving, all-powerful God. You know, if God cares about us, and uh, He, why, why is there evil? And in, and in particular, um, the best theologians don't present this as, in, in a simple sense of why is there evil, but why is there excessive evil? Why does the world have to be as harmful as it is? You know, why do children have to get cancer? Why, you know, is there some solution to this? Um, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear kind of what he has to say about how he thinks his theology can reconcile this. By and large, what we hear is either, well, this is the best of all possible worlds, or man's disobedience brought sin and death into the world, so we're the ones to blame for it. Um, I, I don't buy that this is the best of all possible worlds, um, but it's one of those assertions they can make that they can't ever back up. Because I, I could say, okay, I could, there are other species that do not reproduce sexually. Um, so this sexual reproduction, yes, there are advantages to it, and you know, it's the sort of thing that encourages coupling and building a society. So there's always some tap dance you can do around this, but you could make it so that um, Nobody under, let's say, the age of 18, uh, you know, that, it, that it, at some point you reach sexual maturity, and prior to that, not only is there no sexual interest, but there's no capacity for it, you know, that, so that it would make it essentially impossible um, for a sexually mature adult to rape a child. That is at least somewhat feasible. It would keep the mechanics of the things that people want to point out are good in society. I may not go down this road because I don't want to be, you know, going to Nazis, going to rape, going to the sorts of things that where a single word just triggers something in somebody's mind um, may not be the best thing. But I can certainly imagine ways that the world could potentially be slightly less bad. Um, I could also be convinced that we are living in essentially the best of all possible worlds. In order to maximize, you know, in order to have weather that changes and blah, 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 uh, you're going to have to have tornadoes and that means that you're going to have to wipe out people's houses. The problem is this, for those people who think that there's a heaven, they think that there is a better world. And some of them are convinced that free will exists there, it's just that the people there will ne would never exercise that free will for evil. Um, but you could, you could imagine an idyllic place that's better than what we have. Um, and that place is perhaps 
what someone would argue for. How does atheism resolve the problem of evil and suffering? It doesn't. I, evil is a label we put on actions that ostensibly, I mean, I wouldn't call a tornado evil. This is something that I would apply to what thinking agents do, that they've taken actions that are directly harmful to others and we just categorize it as evil. How do I explain this? It's human nature. It's the result of the universe that we live in, that there's a universal indifference. And in much the same way, which I know we're going to get to afterlife in a second, I think religions have pre prepared people uh, or, or failed to prepare people for the realities of life. Uh, death is something difficult to cope with, so we're going to tell you that there's a happy place that you're going to go to after you die. The fact that the universe doesn't seem to care about you, the fact that sometimes children get terminal illnesses or are born with deformities, uh, or that there are parasites that uh, prey on people. Uh, all of these things that are just part of nature, we, we reject them and say, oh my gosh, these things cause suffering. Why, why would a loving God create a universe that's like this? It's a really good question. The question doesn't play when you say, why would a universe create? Because the universe isn't loving. The universe doesn't have a purpose. The, these are things that evolved in the competitive environment. These are the facts of nature that uh, entropy is going to win out and that there are um, harmful things uh, that we live and die and we consume. And if instead of trying to convince people that there should be some sort of explanation for this, getting them to recognize that this is the way things are, now you have to deal with it, helps us prepare. You don't start out with false expectations. It's like coddling children to the point that they think when they get out in the, into the world and they're no longer under their parents' wing, they think the world's going to be fair. They think that they're going to get what they deserve. And sometimes, as we know, people don't get what they deserve. Sometimes good pe bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. And if you go into the world with the knowledge that this happens, it can be a strengthening tool to help you cope with the harsh realities. And it also lets you appreciate when reality isn't harsh. It lets you realize that if uh, when I fall in love with someone or when I have a good meal or when I am able to communicate with somebody and, and gain a new understanding of some truth about the world or help them do that, that these are good things. It allows me to take responsibility for my actions, take credit, credit for my su successes. I don't have to attribute, well, you know, hey, you survived that bus crash, so it's a miracle. Or they took you to the hospital and the doctors worked on you on you all night. Praise God. No, praise the doctors. It allows us to deal with reality on reality's terms. And, and I think this is going to tie back into the, the answer that I had earlier, which is, you know, we're here. What are we going to do with it? You're, you're here now. How are you going to deal with it? The world is harsh on occasion, but it's not all harsh. It's not all misery. Imagine for some people uh, that doesn't seem to be true. For some people, it's definitely not true. Uh, but by and large, it's just life. And dealing with it on its own terms is the best way to make sure that you optimize your chances to have the best life that you can and that people around you that you care about can have the best life they can. Uh, the last question, what's your belief on the afterlife and how does it, that belief speak, uh, affect or speak to your life in the present? Um, it's a great question. I, I go back to uh, what Penn Jillette said years ago um, that, you know, as far as we can tell you, you've got this one life so you might as well live it the best you can. Um, if, if there's an afterlife or some kind of bonus. I've addressed this question many, many times. I think that between these five questions, um, I can construct a narrative. Uh, and, and you're kind of watching me do that on the fly, where we've asked about meaning and purpose, we've asked about the problem of evil and suffering, now we're asking about an afterlife, and we started with misconceptions. Um, and if you weave all that together, we're really trying to address the biggest questions. Um, and on that front, you know, where do we come from, where are we going, how are we going to deal with it? I think religions have done a bad job of preparing people to deal with death. If instead we were to teach people that death is an unavoidable, eventual consequence of life, it would fundamentally change how people view this. If you have rifts in your family and you uh, never reconcile those, that can weigh heavy, heavily on you. you know, your father passes away and you weren't on speaking terms. And if you believe in a heaven and an afterlife, well, you can convince yourself that that's all right, we'll work it out up there. I don't have to feel bad about the fact that maybe it was my fault we didn't reconcile. Instead, if you don't have that opportunity, 
you, you now have a choice. You can work to uh, engage in that sort of reconciliation while you're still around. You can work to make sure that sort of falling out doesn't happen. You can change the nature of discussions um, so that you don't quite get to that point. Um, and if it turns out there's an afterlife, okay, that's a bonus. It doesn't, it, there's been no demonstration of it. It doesn't seem to be the sort of thing that I can do anything about. Um, and I will probably, in the discussions, do what I've done many times in the past, which is to talk about the fact that given what we understand about the brain and personality and identity, that the notion of a soul is, and this is my phrasing, the single most dead concept in all of theology. The notion that something that makes me me survives my death is almost as obviously false as something could be. And we know this from investigating patients with brain damage where personalities are reset. None of it makes any sense. Um, and there's, there's a lot to think about. So I'm going to keep mulling over these questions for the next couple of days until Monday night at the event. And uh, I hope to get a video of the event to post so that you can compare what I've said here. Uh, maybe I came up with something better. Maybe I came up with something worse. But hopefully this has given you kind of some insight into when I'm presented with, we're going to have a discussion and it's going to cover these topics. You basically, in a live, unedited, uncut stream of consciousness, got to see exactly how I think about it and how I can talk myself out of certain answers, how I probably won't go down, uh, you know, when we're talking about suffering, I don't need to go to the notions of, of rape or uh, you, you could probably start with something fairly small and simple and maybe, as I, as I kind of leapt to there, point out that among believers they at least acknowledge that heaven uh, is a place where, where the suffering doesn't exist. So if God knows everybody that's going to go to heaven, why didn't he just create all those people there in the first place rather than creating everybody, making us trod through this, uh, this strange and curious life uh, that is irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. The 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years that I might spend on this planet um, have essentially no consequence in compared to the eternity that I'm going to spend afterwards. And if this is just a testing ground or a place to wipe my feet, uh, that means that everybody I've ever loved, everything I've ever done, everything I've ever learned, everything I've ever enjoyed is all just kind of background noise vanishingly small portions of the, of the whole. And I don't know what, what the purpose would be of such a test uh, or anything in that vein. It seemed to me that if I was a god, why would I create anything in the first place? But if I am, and I'm going to create people, and eventually I'm going to re reward some of these people with the happy, the happy place and punish the rest of them with the bad place, why do I need to do that? Why do I need to create the people who are going to suffer for eternity in hell? What does that say about my character that rather than creating a bunch of companions uh, who are constructed in such a way that they are essentially the people who would end up here through this trial, I mean, God should be able to just create those people and stick them right in heaven and not have to have all, that, all those other individuals. Uh, or, and this is why some Christians get to this thing about annihilation theory, um, there isn't an actual literal hell and suffering forever. It's just people like me cease to exist. We're annihilated. That is, uh, that is one way to reconcile all this. And it's something I'm actually fine with um, because I don't have a fear of being dead. Uh, get to the Mark Twain quote about I was dead for a billion years before I was born and it never troubled me one bit. So that's the, the quick thoughts on uh, Monday's debate. We'll see how it goes and I'll post that. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.